she has worked there for seven years. Her specialty is in Scandinavian literature and language, and she studies sociolinguistics for her PhD. She's also a published author, and you will see a couple of her books out on the bookshelf book in the foyer. Maggie, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try to wrap up this session. It's a bit of a longer session with four speakers instead of three, but I'm going to try to wrap it up by returning to the um, topic of renewable energy in Orkney, but also using um, a literary perspective, so trying to tie up tie uh, off the loose ends here by talking about Eben and Flowen, which is a book that came out uh, a few months ago. It's by the poet Alec Finlay, the ethnographer and poet Laura Watts, and photographer Alistair Peebles. <laughs> <laughs> yes, these photos are, are yours, Alistair. Um, and I'm going to talk about one poem from this book. Um, after Gareth and Laura, we sometimes used to say, Gareth being Gareth Davis, the managing director of uh, the marine renewable energy company Aquaterra, um, and Laura Watts, the ethnographer who contributed to this book. And I chose this poem because it's so beautiful, it manages to capture a lot of these narratives and voices that we're hearing, for example, in Laura's ethnographic report and Becky's research and all those narratives that are going on um, in Orkney about renewable energy and boom, put it on the page as a poem. So, with new devices and new industries comes the need for new meaning making, making new mythologizing. Uh, and the poet Alec Finley here explores this um, in Eben and Flowen, um, which is a bit of a total work where image, words and location interact in the meaning making process. And it explores meetings of past and future in the present, um, the meetings between the imagined and the real, as dreams, plans and visions are realised, the meetings with nature and technology, the designed and managed and known versus the untamed and uncharted. Uh, it's in these meetings that the meaning making is situated and new meaning is created. Orkney's um, marine energy sector is itself on the boundary between the known and unknown, the familiar and the uncharted, the domesticated and the untamed. There's a primeval energy in the Pentland Firth that's not yet ordered or managed and as the Orkney community fully well knows it's capable of swallowing boats and tearing equipment apart. Um, energy is destructive and yet when tamed we depend upon it. Energy that exists in a myriad of forms or is perhaps formless, it just is like the world was in old Norse creation myth as it began a boundless chaos of fiery and hot and icy cold where nothing was yet sorted into its proper place. No energy knows where to begin or end. So Orkney is a test site where new prototype technologies are explored and put to the test against these untamed forces of the element. But these devices are new and unfamiliar to us as well, to those who work with them and to the community. And like with animals, we need to build up a relationship of trust between us and them slowly. Tidal energy is moored to the moon. So a mooring is an attempt at controlling. But like the bull, which is only gingerly controlled by the farmer, it can turn against us at any time. So a mooring to the moon changes our perspective from the near and familiar moorings of tidal energy devices and ships to the distant perspective where the moon and earth are celestial bodies in the vast universe and tied to each other through an invisible umbilical cord of gravitational force. So the fixing of the tides mooring is outside of this earth and outside of our control. But yet when seen from the earth, the moon is a close and familiar point in the vast and unexplored space as if it were a stepping stone towards the unknown. So our technology, ships, oil rigs, tidal energy devices are also linking points between the human world and the vast depths of uncharted ocean. 
the moon defines where the sea, where in the sea highway, the energy is generated. So the highway is on the sea's surface, the part of the sea that humans are using and have been using since the invention of sails. They cast our thoughts back to Orkney's Norse past when the islands were the, in the middle of a busy trade route and that all was operated by ship. Um, since then we've had the age of tall ships and the age of steam and now what we might call the age of cruise liners. <laughs> um, a highway has urban connotations. From this perspective the sea has been charted and put to use for human purposes and energy is reduced to managed energy, for example in the form of electricity. But yet human control is restricted to the surface, to the horizontal plane. The vertical, the movement of the tide is outside of human control and defined by the moon. So the moon is given its own agency, its own sentience, as it is traditionally in poetry. It, um, it cycles and phases and up and down influence on the tide is given meaning through interpreting it as human moods. See words here, um, mind, highs, lows, distress, suffers, turn the tide, mind, tide turn, blade, wave energy is in the highs and lows. Waves are written by weather systems in winds which distress the ocean's surface. Water suffers its surroundings after Leonardo. Leonardo da Vinci, the engineer and artist, the words distress and suffer now suddenly take on their scientific meaning for an engineer trained in materials technology and for the meteoro meteorologist studying wind patterns and effects on wave heights. Leonardo was the scientist who tamed nature by capturing it in art and domesticating it through engineering. Now, the, light tur the line turn the tide mind invites us to turn our minds to renewable energy to get to know this alternative way of thinking about energy for the future. Wave energy is in. <laughs> the, the waves define an irregular baseline. But think. Air is thin, water is thick, air is similar, the world over, not so water. A wave in water is so much more than a wave in air. The ocean is our unknown world. The Orkney Islands are characterised by a lack of wilderness on land. It's relatively flat, it's surveyable, it's agricultural. The wilderness lies in the ocean, met by the sea cliffs caves and gloops, the ocean is where in folklore Orkney meets the other world. The realm of the selkie, the seals, shapeshifters and the magical fin folk, the giant stoorworm sea serpent, uh, the sailors and fishermen uh, adopted to vanishing islands. As late as in the 1890s and again in 1913 there were reports in the local press of mermaids really having been seen. Um, the language of science, of labs and engineering seems fragile against the vastness and power of this uncharted realm. Has your device been ocean tested? As Becky found in her PhD fieldwork, the ocean test is the ultimate test. <laughs> and other more experienced users of the sea, such as fishermen and creel boat crew, have been observed to express little confidence that the scientists and engineers realise the true power of the ocean after having tested their inter intricate devices only in a laboratory tank. On one occasion, for example, <laughs> they were passing bets uh, on which part of expensive equipment would break first. <laughs> That's <what it> is. <laughs> Fieldwork data. Um, to <coughs> survive the wild tide, the device must be lived and lowered. So when a new device is invented and introduced to seas around Earth, the device also enters the narrative, which constructs the community's understanding of it. Uh, it's lowered. Uh, as formerly fishing equipment and lobster creels and so on have been lowered before. Nicknames enter the narrative, interconnecting you and old lore, and, and the naming of the devices themselves. The oyster uh, converts the sea movement to electricity. The old 
crew or enclosure for plants or animals is now Bilia Crew, the world's only multi-birth purpose-built open sea test facilities for wave and tidal energy converters. Words develop new meanings. A device must float but leave off being a boat. The sea's density wields a high torque load. Turbines express the powers of nature as currents surge through the coiled gyre of the sunken chamber. So suddenly I think that floats is no longer a boat. A boat having defined darkness culture since the Viking age, or maybe earlier. Um, a torque is no longer of gold, worn proudly around the arm as a symbol of loyalty to the Earl of a reward for a battle well fought, but instead coldly and scientifically refers to the turning power in the non-boat. Um, the coil gyre of the sulphur chamber is equipment turning, both turning round and round, and at the same time turning the wild energy of the sea into tamed electricity. So the old gyre or gyro of the, the ogress of Orkney folklore from Old Norse Gyr, who tied naughty children to her tail and straddled the roof of buildings shouting down the chimney to people, um, and um, uh, who in the Old Norse song sank with her sister to the bottom of the Pentland Firth, where they both perpetually turn and turn and turn a magical quernstone. Um, uh, creating the, a giant whirlpool now as the, as the Swelky. Um, the, the gyro is uh, remembered in many place names, such as the Gyrish Washing Basin in Flotta, and celebrated on Gyro Night in February. She's been tamed. <laughs> but she's coiled. <laughs> she, like the wolf Henry, ready to spring on us, burst her fetters, and spring on the day when the day of destruction comes. Nature always has the last word and claims what humans thought they had put under their management. Be sure, um, oh, it's the next slide. Be sure that your gear will get will get fangled by mollusks and weed. It's not the median tide, but the storm that will finally decide. So, like the gyro, energy is undefined and bound. That does not know where to begin and end. As the sea is in areas, no one device will ever suffice. There are too many possible settings for a fitting form to be settled yet. The devices have become organic in our minds, organisms capable of metamorphosis. Likewise, the gyro has a thousand forms. It's not ready to settle in one shape, as the ethnographer Stuart McLean observed about the gyro night festival. In Orkney, sea tales, the selkie metamorphosis from seal to human and back. Um, and in inland lochs, the nuklavi is both horse and rider at the same time. I see Lydia nodding <laughs> vigorously. Um, and to the scientific mind, metamorphosis happens as evolution, gradually over generations. Devices here are understood as undergoing their own evolution. Estimate. 10,000 sites worldwide suitable for generating from the tide. Each new device is a failure, taking its honourable place in the chain of transformation. Only the next device can incorporate experience. In marine renewable energy, the different forms of human knowledge, lore and science, meet. What is scientific evidence for one is centuries of passed down experience, life and lore for another. Solving the problems of the engineer through the eyes of a sailor. Survival is one proof, destruction another. Nature always has the last word. The understanding of renewable energy devices as a life form continues. So many devices named for gods and sea animals, named for metamorphosis. These devices pump like hearts in the dark. The poem invites us to observe these devices in the way in which the Orkney poet Edwin Muir observed horses um, in the early 20th century with awe and respect, as if these noble creatures belong in a strange parallel world of their own, which somehow exists alongside our human existence here, with which we can interact but not fully enter into. Muir writes, late in the summer, the strange horses came 
We heard a distant tapping on the road, a deepening drumming. It stopped, went on again, and at the corner changed to a hollow thunder. We saw the heads like a wild wave charging and were afraid. And he observes full of wonder. In the first moment, we had never thought that they were creatures to be owned and used. Among them were some half a dozen cults dropped in some wilderness of the broken world, yet new as if they'd come from their own Eden. Since then, they have pulled their ploughs and borne our loads, but that free servitude can still pierce our hearts. Our life is changed. They are coming, our beginning. So the godlike qualities of Oatmuir's horses and Finley's renewable energy devices here stem from the fact that most people don't know exactly how they work. They're not fully controllable, but yet we depend on them. The devices are unfamiliar, unpredictable at times, and they somehow, through this seemingly inexplicable process of metamorphosis, create electricity from waves. They provide us with something that we desperately need, but most of us are not sure how. Um, casting the engineer in the role of a modern-day priest as mediator between us and this unfamiliar <coughs> but crucial entity. Our hearts pump and keep us going, and their hearts pump and keep us going too. We're at their mercy. I think I'm going to skip a bit and move on to the end of my talk here. Um, Something about Orkney identity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Lord, yeah, the next here, the issue of ownership is raised specifically about contested ownership and exploitation and whether anyone can own the sea at all or have the right to exploit it exploitation as opposed to sustainability. Um, Crown estates this local futures after David B. Palmady. The republic of the waves cannot be owned and yet the sea can be crowned. Green gro growth, blue bloom. Venture, capitali no, venture capitalism and mass production share impatience in common. The cycles of venture capitalism, utilities and innovative technology do not share a definition of yesterday, tomorrow or today. So the struggle between the Crown Estates over rights to whatever arrives on the foreshore has become a symbol of Orkney's independence and resistance to British authority. Oh, the law, eh, the Norse law defining the extent of land and sea ownership, um, has um, become the symbol of, of, of Orkney's independence. So the authors explain the controversy by noting that recent objections to leasing areas of the sea to consortia of multinational electricity companies and marine energy developers have been based on Odin law. Some campaigners in Orkney Shetland assert older rights as far as the continental shelf ledge. As if the pawning of Orkney and Shetland to Scotland in 1468 hadn't happened. The argument here is that it was only pawned. <laughs> so we, we still don't have to listen to British authority. And the old law is, is the thing we're holding up against that. Um, I think I'm going to have to skip a bit more here. Um, here dialect. A local tide of breath and thought. Why is dialect such a powerful symbol of the avant-garde desire to be different and simultaneous deep-seated need to connect and link and build bridges to something familiar to Orkney's traditional life? Later in the book, Finley explores a place with words for things to do with the sea, many of which are from Norn, the old Scandinavian language that was spoken in Orkney until late in the century. Acadians are still proud of their dialect's links to Norn, having retained many words even after the language itself died. And another source of difference, and thereby a source of pride. But each of these Norn words name a crucial part of Orkney traditional life, with boats, uh, fish, uh, fishing equipment, etc. Maybe dialect is the material which we with which we can build our bridge to the future. Through dialect, we can lower the alien energy devices 
and make them part of our island culture. When will knowledge and vernacular sayings transfer from the old fishermen to the new breed of wave right? So ultimately, the poem is a wailing image that finally connects the past and the future. At least I understand it as a wailing image. The devices have taken on a life of their own and become animal-like, perhaps with their own free will, or at least ability to act without human instruction, and we don't know if they're a friend or foe. Stand by the shore, be aware, there could be a host of devices out there. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to run because I'm chairing the next session. Starts now. Bye!